Hello and welcome to the Kamla Show. We bring you interviews and conversations with technologists, entrepreneurs, filmmakers, and other news from in and around the San Francisco Bay Area. My guests today are filmmakers Morgan Neville and Katrin Rogers, and we talk to them about their film, The Music of Strangers, Yo Yo Ma, and the Silk Road Ensemble. The New York Times describes the film as lovely to watch, but it's even more beautiful to hear. And the Washington Post says, Strangers is only superficially about music. It's also about cultural identity, the meaning of home, and the debt we owe our ancestors. Here are Morgan Neville and Katrin Rogers. Welcome to San Francisco. Thanks. Thanks for having me. Thank you. So the film that we're talking about is The Music of Strangers, Yo-Yo Ma and the Silk Road Ensemble. What was the goal of the film to quote Yo-Yo Ma himself? Because in the film, he quotes, I don't know what my goal is. Somebody, when he was studying at Harvard, said, have you found your tone? So I want to put those two questions back to you and ask, what was the goal? What was the tone you were looking to achieve in this film? Well, when I first met Yo-Yo, it was four and a half years ago. And the first night I met him, um, I knew a couple of things. One is I was willing to follow him with a camera anywhere. And the second thing was that he was asking all the questions as a musician that I'd been asking as a filmmaker. You know, namely, does it matter? You know, what role does culture play in the world? And in a world so um, so messed up, is culture useful? Um I mean, I think this is a question he's been asking himself for a long time. And, you know, he told me the story that in his 30s, he had basically a midlife crisis. And because he had been famous since he was seven, I guess it makes sense he would have that crisis in his 30s where he first asked himself, do I even want to be a musician? I never chose to do this. This was something that was thrust upon me and I was good at it. And the answer he comes to is, I'm going to do it if it can be about more than just music. And if I can see what I can do with music... And he's asking these questions of, is music a useful tool for social change? Is music um, a useful way to build bridges where politics and religion aren't? These are questions I ask myself as a filmmaker all the time. So that got me hooked right away. And in many ways, I felt like the questions, the journey he's on is the journey I've been on, too. So in some ways, uh, collaborate with people regardless of your race, religion, color, geography, but try to work with each other. Well, work with each other, but I think it's more that music, like film, is actually a a medium of empathy. And that you can't perform music with somebody or even listen to music with somebody without having some measure of empathy for who's creating it. And I think film is the same. You know, I think that's what we try and do. And in a world so divided by fear and demonization of the other, that whatever you can do to diffuse those kinds of fears is useful. And that's exactly what music and film can do. Kate, how did you get involved? Uh, you are an Academy Award winning filmmaker for 20 feet from stars, Sorry. stardom. <laughs> so what is it? What was your goal in being involved in this film? Well, I had done 20 Feet from Stardom with Morgan, and uh, this film sort of came up while we were finishing 20 Feet, and um, Morgan was approached by Yo-Yo Ma and kind of got into it doing a concert film with um, with Yo-Yo, and when we finished 20 Feet, I was excited to work with Morgan again, and um, I knew Yo-Yo from growing up. He's kind of has a house in the same area where I am from, and um, I, the Berkshires where Tanglewood is. And so he was kind of a local celebrity. I mean, a major world celebrity, but also a local celebrity. And uh, so I was very excited to get the chance to work with him and to meet him. And, um, you know, I like doing films with Morgan and about subjects that I actually don't know that much about. So for this, you know, when we got into it, I didn't know that much about classical music or the Silk Road Ensemble. And for me, it was really exciting to sort of dig in and start to learn about this whole genre of music that I knew nothing about. And all of these fantastic musicians from places in the world that, you know, I didn't actually know that much about either. I mean, the the thing I'll say is I don't think anybody knows that much about it, except for, you know, the real musicologists. Yeah, you know, I don't think Yo-Yo knew much about a lot of this. I mean, part of what 
he's tried to do is use this as a way to expand his horizons. And same for all these other musicians. These other musicians weren't experts. You know, the Chinese musician was not an expert on Persian music and vice versa. So um, I think everybody kind of came to this project as this is a way to kind of learn and understand about other cultures and to put a face and a music and a, you know, an identity to some place that might just be a something on the map that we don't really know anything about. Before we go dig deeper into the film, I just want to uh, clarify something about the film itself. You've worked on various uh, musicians, Rolling Stone, the roots music in some ways of rock and roll. You've worked on Muddy Waters. You've worked on... Uh the country musician Johnny Cash and Yo-Yo Ma and his ensemble. So is Yo-Yo Ma the roots music for world uh, music in a way? I mean, if you call, you know, class, the classical canon roots, <laughs> maybe. Although I actually think, you know, the classical canon is, is pretty pretty new. Like that's the new trendy music compared to just how old so much of this other music is. You know, so much of the Indian, Chinese and Persian music way predates what was going on in, in Europe with uh, what we think of as kind of classical composition. Um, and so for me, you know, I, I'm a music fanatic, of course, but, and we were talking about this before, that music is a Trojan horse itself into telling different kinds of stories. And so um, you can make a film about music but really the film is about something else too the best music films are about more than just music music is the the thing that brings you in and brings an audience and brings energy and nostalgia or emotion or a whole bunch of different things you know it's an amazing tool to have as a filmmaker to be able to use music it can't be about just music so this Trojan horse has a political and a musical payload. The political payload is when you examine the lives of Wuman from China, K.N. Kalar, the Iranian musician who plays the Kamenche, Christina Pato, who plays the bagpipe, and Keenan Azmeh, who was born in Damascus. So through their music, you're also examining the political contours of their country and what happened. Yeah, I mean, I think part of it for me was that in the West, we tend to take culture for granted. What do you mean? Well, I mean, when we cut education funding, arts programming is usually the first thing to go. Um, when, in fact, if you want to listen to the arguments about it, you know, arts education teaches the skills that we most want from what we say we must want from our employees, which is um, ability to work with teams, ability to be um, improvisational, creative, all those kinds of skills are exactly what music, for instance, teaches. Um, and I think we forget that to be a musician in a country like China or Iran is itself a provocative and maybe even political act in a way that we really don't think of it in the West um, and that many musicians have been jailed or exiled because of their music, not just because of their words. And, you know, I started, as I started to think about it and talking about political science, you know, when you start talking about cultural revolutions in China or Syria or Iran or even Russia or Spain, for that matter, under Franco, you know, and whether those cultural revolutions are um, fascist or religious or political, that they're called cultural revolutions for a reason, <laughs> that um, the easiest way to subjugate somebody is to erase their culture because it's how we self-identify. And once you do that, um, that's when things get really ugly because, um, you know, in, in the film, um, I think Kavork, um, who's the artist from Syria, who grew up in Syria with, uh, yeah, he's Armenian, but he grew up in Syria and Aleppo um, as a Christian. And um, he said we didn't even know the difference between being a Christian, a Kurd, a Shia, Sun a Sunni, that, um, that that's kind of incredible to think about, that this is just 20 years ago. I mean, this is an ancient history. And that once you start erasing the things that connect us, it's much easier to make us start to hate each other. As a producer, what was your role? Because you traveled across so many countries and, uh, you know, you had to work with different musicians. What were some of the challenges you faced in making this film? Yeah, it was incredibly difficult to shoot in, you know, five different countries in eight different languages, 
none of them languages I speak. Um, and, you know, just down to figuring out how, how do you film in a refugee camp? How are we going to do execute a pop-up show in a public square in Turkey? Uh, all of these were just, you know, I think every shoot we did was just one challenge after another. It wasn't your typical interview setup where you have your go-to crew and you know how to throw it together in 10 minutes. This was, you know, trying to find local people on the ground who could help us get the crew and the locations we needed. And, I mean, I will give Kate all of her um, for props for pulling it together. I mean, from a producing point of view, it was an insanely difficult project to do. Um, and then in countries like China, where we, um, because we were there with Yo-Yo, you know, you can't shoot under the table. You know, a lot of people will have a little camera, a DSLR, and they'll shoot and kind of get away with it. And there's no way we we're going to be able to shoot where we wanted to shoot with somebody as famous as Yo-Yo and the other musicians. Um, so in China, for instance, we had to get a uh, government minder to watch us. And what it turned out, fortunately, was that he was much more interested in um, sleeping on the bus than ever paying attention to anything we were doing. So pretty much he would uh, drop us off in the morning, sleep and read the paper. And then at the end of the day, he would drive us back. <laughs> so we got lucky there. Um, the opening shot, it took me a minute to figure out that that was Istanbul. And that was across was Bosphorus, and that was the Hagia Sophia. It was a very, very unusual shot of the mosque. Mm -hmm. And uh, for a minute, I thought maybe you were in Italy, you know, because uh, you were duped because of the tile and the kids and the crap and everything. Why did you choose to shoot it that way? How long did you spend on that opening shot, figuring out that this is how I want? I kind of want people to pull in and kind of, you wanted us to think. You were actually playing where in the world is Kami in San Diego kind of a thing. Well, I, I think it was less about trying to figure out exactly what the first shot was, but it was more deciding what the location was. So we were shooting right on the banks of the Bosphorus, right on the European side of Istanbul, looking at Asia across the river. So if you're talking about bridging gaps, I mean, Istanbul is one of those cities that connects so many different cultures. And right there, you're literally on the edge of two continents. So I think that spoke to us. Of course, specifically getting into shots i love to say everything was completely planned out but throwing a pop-up show in a square in istanbul with an rainstorm about to come down and incredibly high humidity it it was more madness than, than planning and kate can testify to that there you did it's documentary at the end of the day so we kind of we went and looked at the square i think the day before to have an idea but and we had lunch there, so we were there for maybe an hour. But we didn't spend that much time kind of figuring out what the shots were. We just knew that we had to get in there. They had to set up and play, and we just had to get it in whatever way that we could. And luckily, I think it panned out pretty well. No, it was it was so fast. And part of it is, um, you know, Yo-Yo has this Stradivarius cello, a priceless cello, How essentially. I mean, I don't even know if you could. I think it's priceless. Yeah, yeah. you can't really <laughs> buy one. Um, you know, because of the humidity he couldn't even have it outside for very long. So it's not like we could just keep it there. So we had a PA that had to run it and other instruments to an air-conditioned hotel nearby who at the last minute would run in with the instruments <laughs> and, uh, and then we could start performing. <laughs> wow. Um, let's talk about the notion of home, which is one of the things that you examine. The Silk Road was this ancient trade route that connected parts, the far corners of Asia. What I grew up learning was Asia, which included, you know, Syria, and all those countries, you know, all the way up to Japan. That was Asia for me, mm -hmm. you know. And then the Americans changed everything. They made it Middle East, Far East, Near East, and it got me confused. Uh, but in this uh, film, you are looking at the new Silk Route in some, in some ways. You're recreating the old Silk Route and the music that flowed and the trade that flowed and all the interaction that happened along that path. When the caravans arrive, you know, when they travel in caravans, these nomad travelers and musicians, they would have had their own idea of home, but we're talking centuries ago. Today, what is the definition of home that is exploring in this movie? Because that whole notion has changed. And, you know, Yo-Yo, I think he started initially with this, it's the metaphor of the Silk Road, but he started very much kind of thinking about Silk Road countries. But it's, and the film we kind of realized early on, it was about the metaphor, the idea of the Silk Road being the idea that 
things we think of as pure parts of our culture, in fact, um, have been shared going back thousands of years. And the Silk Road is something that brought not only silk and spice, but algebra and Islam, you know, from one end of the continent to the other, thinking about what that means. And so part of what I saw each character's journey was this idea that they came from a from a home, Every, and by that home also meaning a musical tradition, because they all were expert in their own tradition they came from, but then they all ventured out into something that was not expected of them. You know, they they all could have stayed and played the same role in the local orchestra or music school or conservatory if they wanted, but they all returned home with this new kind of worldliness. I mean, this is the kind of the, the reason we picked the characters was because of that uniformity of, of the journey. They've all had this kind of hero's journey in a way, you know, away from home and then back to home. And home is, I mean, it's a big question, and I think they have different answers for it. What is what is home? And I love what Kenan says, which is it's a place you want to contribute to without having to justify it. And I think for me, that's about a, as good a definition as you can get. When you were shooting this film, and you know, one of like we talked about, home was a theme explored. How did your idea of home change after making this film? Oh, that's a very good question. Um, I think I sort of I realized that home doesn't necessarily mean just one place, um, and that these are all people who have started somewhere and gone elsewhere. And home is sort of what they bring with them and what they surround themselves with and that you can have multiple homes and it's much more about where you are and what you have and who you're surrounded with rather than an actual physical place. I mean, the one thing I'll say is, I mean, to me, in a way, the music of Strangers is kind of an oxymoron um, that you can't make music with somebody and be a stranger with them. And I think that's the idea. And I think the ensemble them itself and each other have become a home too that i think they see each other as part of a now part of a family they started as strangers but they're very much a family mm. now we didn't talk about yo-yo ma at all but you show us a different side of yo-yo ma where he says no when he's being introduced after the first uh, few minutes and he's being introduced at some concert and they say Juliet, he says wrong he says 18 grammys doesn't matter you know so he's got this so he seems like a very down to earth human mm -hmm. being and then Apparently, when you hung out with him, uh, you were drinking the very first mm -hmm. night and he was cracking you up with some bad jokes and he was using some really bad words. Mm -hmm. So that's a, that's not the image that we carry of Yo-Yo Ma. No, which is what I think um, struck me about him from the beginning. But the thing I've come to realize is Yo-Yo, who can be such a prankster, which you don't expect, but he doesn't just do it for fun. He does it because it actually serves a purpose that he is expert if you go into a room with him and making him not feel like he should be on a pedestal mm. and you should not be intimidated he is so good at getting people relaxed and i think part of him having the sometimes sophomore sense of humor he has is he say if this guy's making this joke then i you know i guess i shouldn't be that uptight around him and that's really valuable i mean and he has the way he doesn't really want things to be about him um, you know, if you ask him questions about himself, he flips it on you and starts makes it about you. And he's very good at finding the most uncomfortable person in the room and going straight to them and making them feel comfortable. It's quite amazing. So it tells you that he was a very observant kid because he grew up in Paris. His parents were Chinese. His father was teaching and learning in France. Must have felt isolated because as a Chinese, uh, as someone of Chinese heritage, learning to speak French and then coming to America, learning English and then playing a classical instrument. Everything where he probably had to m somehow make himself feel comfortable. Sure. I mean, English was his third language and, you know, being a prodigy. And we show him in the film performing for um, Kennedy in, I think it was 1962 or maybe as early 63. He's seven. And you realize, here's somebody who spent their whole early life around adults, not so much around kids around them, that he, I think, took it all in. I mean, he said if he wasn't a musician, he'd probably be a sociologist or an anthropologist. I mean, I think he's really fascinated in human behavior. And in a way, this whole project is how he's tried to 
figure out how music can decode that. We did talk about 9-11, which was in a way a catalyst for this whole thing. He had started it in 1998, but then in 2000 is when I think he really put his efforts into this. Has he ever talked to you about what, uh, where he was during 9-11? Yeah, he, he did, and it was important um, because he they came up with the idea in 98. They had done the first workshops when they actually got musicians together in 2000, but it wasn't supposed to be an ongoing um, effort. And, and really, the events of 9-11 made him understand that the work of bringing musicians to the Middle East, to Middle America, and musicians from Middle America to the Middle East, in part, is an incredibly valuable thing to be doing at that time, and, and then some. And, uh, I mean, that day, he was in a hotel in Arizona, and uh, his wife called him, and he was on tour. They had um, canceled the shows and he ended up taking a bus back all the way from Arizona to get home to Boston, where he lives. And I think it was those three days he spent on the bus thinking that really kind of changed his idea about what, what he could contribute. And I think that was this ensemble. And I think they were really nervous the first shows they did after 9-11. They weren't sure how people were going to receive it. I think their first show was in Atlanta. Um, and the audience response was just so overwhelming that I think that just sort of solidified things for them. Well, and then also in October of 2001, I think just a month after 9-11, um, they performed at the dedication of the newly restored Citadel in Aleppo, Syria. Um which also was important. So again, it's not just taking these musicians from Iran to Atlanta. It's taking musicians from, you know, Atlanta to Syria at the time. And, um, and they said it was an incredibly powerful ceremony. And of course, now that same citadel's been destroyed in the, in the war in Syria. Thank you so much for bringing the music of strangers to a whole bunch of strangers, <laughs> to maybe 7 billion strangers. Thank you so much. Thank you for having us. Thank you. You were listening to an interview with Morgan Neville and Katrin Rogers about the music of Strangers, Yo-Yo Ma and the Silk Road Ensemble. You can listen to this and other interviews on our website or on iTunes. You can watch our TV interviews on our YouTube channel. And I'm on Twitter. My handle is at Kamla. If you have any questions, suggestions or feedback, please feel free to send them to us. We look forward to them. And as always... Thank you for tuning in.